I want to be the first to welcome you on behalf of the Economic Innovation Group and our co-host, the uh, Governor's Woods Foundation under the chairmanship of Richard Vague and of course, Steve Clements, to uh, the seventh annual Summit on the Economy. Uh, we're going to have a great day today and it's an amazing time to be talking about economic policy. I'd argue that one of the most important uh, lessons we got from the 2016 elections is that the economy is the centerpiece of the national conversation right now, both of our politics, but, but just what, what people are interested in talking about. And that makes a lot of sense. We just came out of the most destructive recession for not just this country, but the world since the Great Depression. And yet, if you look at the, a lot of the economic statistics, things, things in this country seem to be doing pretty well. I mean, we have the lowest unemployment rate in about 10 years. We've got an enormous amount of cheap capital. Corporate profits are super high. The stock market is at record highs. And then if you look underneath some of those statistics, you see a whole different picture. You see a picture where wages are barely rising, although they're doing better than productivity, just barely. You see a, a, a moment where um, labor mobility is at 40-year lows. Labor participation is at 40-year lows. New business creation is at an historic decline. So which is it? Are we, do we have an economy that's robustly recovered, or do we have one that's still suffering underneath the headline statistics? And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Maybe the most alarming statistic is when you look at the American dream. So for the first time in a generation, uh, for the first time in several generations, this generation's chances of achieving the American dream are worse than the previous one. That rate of, so of socioeconomic mobility has lessened dramatically. And that's impacting both how people feel about the future, but also our politics, which is also incredibly polarized. In fact, the most interesting conversations, I'd argue, are not between Republicans and Democrats, although they're doing plenty of arguing. It's within the parties where you see a debate in both parties among the, the establishment wing of their party and the growing populace. And of course, this is a political reality, not just in the US, but across all of Europe. And it's leading to all sorts of interesting political results. Emmanuel Macron was just elected the president of France, a largely independent who center-left politician who put a, a, uh, a, a, a center-right uh, foreign minister into his cabinet, trying to form a coalition government. And there's obviously new political trends happening in our own country. So this is all making for a very fascinating time in, in, in US history. And we're going to discuss a number of the issues uh, that are really important to that conversation today. We're going to take a look at competition and whether the US needs a new form of competition policy, whether we're still an entrepreneurial nation, whether economic power is too concentrated, uh, whether what the future of capitalism looks like and the future of work uh, and what we do about regions of the economy that have been left behind. And we're going to tackle all those issues and more. And now, I know I've become a downer at cocktail parties these days, and we're going to have a whole breadth of additional uh, speakers, experts from the media, from the private sector, from the policy-making circles, uh, and from academia, who are going to share their views on a number of these issues uh, and more. So really excited that they're all here today, and mostly really excited that you're all here today. Uh, let me give a, a, a quick uh, a couple logistical items. Uh, one, we're going to run pretty seamless, seamlessly between now and about 4.30, having a set of really interesting back-to-back -back discussions. We have almost three dozen speakers, panelists, moderators uh, throughout the course of the day. We're going to break for lunch. In between, that lunch will be four and a half minutes long, so don't <laughs> leave. Uh, and then we're going to break for Steve Clement's favorite part of the day, which is the cocktail hour. Uh, so please do stay for that if you're able to. Um, and w one other point, everything today is going to be on the record. We're videotaping it in the back. We encourage uh, you guys to engage on social media. We have a hashtag behind me, hashtag EconSummit17. So tweet, post on Facebook, take photos on Instagram, take selfies, wh whatever floats your boat today. We want this to be your summit. Um, uh, one uh, additional thing, and and, and most importantly, uh, some thank yous. Uh, one to the Governor's Woods Foundation who underwritten, underwritten today's gathering uh, under their chairmanship, Richard Vague, and also with the tremendous work uh, by Reza Mueller who has helped to do a lot of behind the scenes work. 
Um, additionally, I need to thank Caroline Lanford and Lindsay Polloway from The Atlantic. And from the Economic Innovation Group, we have a tremendous team here. My co-founder and one of the smartest people in the policy world, John Latiri, uh, Amanda Bird, Melitza Kosic, Ken Fickery, and Liz Hippel. Uh, and uh, for all those folks, if we could please give them a round of applause for all their work today. And I'm forgetting somebody to thank. I know he's tall, he's lanky, he's not wearing a tie, he's wearing funny socks. I think he's standing right behind me. The, one of our favorite people at the Economic Innovation Group, a provocateur, a extraordinaire, and a, and a good friend. Let me introduce to you Steve Clements. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, bud. Thank you, Steve, and great to see with all of you here today. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time together. I think one of the things that we do, uh, we don't get enough opportunity to do in Washington is have big think conferences. This is your conference. Ask questions. Make it matter. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time together. I wish I had, you know, at the end of a marathon, 26.2 miles, we give, you know, either get a mug, a t-shirt, or a medal. Uh, we're going to give you crafted cocktails. Um, there was one called the Glickman G7, I think, and the other is, uh, one of the others, there, there are, I think, three. Um, but, but if life gives you Clemens. Uh, <laughs> so, if you stay till 4.30, you're going to have a good drink. Um, I, I wanted to just say just a couple of quick words, because I want to get the show on the road here. Um, when I worked in the United States Senate for Jeff Bingaman in the 1990s, and this was a time, you know, you're going to see Laura Tyson here later today, but this was a time when you had the IT uh, uh, boom going on, you had job creation through the roof, and there was just something that didn't make sense. You had a Democratic president, an IT boom going on, you had a more turbulent economy, people were moving from job to job to job. It was a high trust time. So you had you know, trust that money would come in the door as fast as it was going, you had just in time jobs, you could lose your job, you could get a job. It was a kind of uh, go get them time. And when you began looking at it, you realized when it came to things like education benefits, uh, pension benefits, things that might equip uh, people, working people, and give them the opportunity to surf that turbulence more easily. None of that was being invested in. I worked on uh, legislation at that time and a package of proposals that might have in the 1990s led to a very different time today. I'm going to talk about it, Laura Tyson, and talk about the negligence and what they didn't do at that time um, uh, in Washington that might have been helpful to people to be able to deal with more of what we're seeing here. So there are fewer left behind communities, fewer left behind people, uh, and perhaps better preparation for the time we're in. But this is your conference. We're going to have a lot of um, uh, folks from different angles, and that is what we want to do. This is my favorite thing uh, I do each year. I was talking to my friend here. He's been every, I think he's been at all seven, seven of these things. He was kind of bitching about some of the speakers today, but you know, that's what he does. Um, now let me tell you about um, how we're going to start this this morning. We're gonna, I'm going to help play MC during the day along with my uh, friend Steve Glickman, um, who's trying really hard to be funny. And uh, we're going to do this. But in this first session with Congressional Outlook, I just want to say something, just put something on the table. We had a, a Republican U.S. Senator lined up to join us. Because if you're doing a forum called Congressional Outlook and you've got a Democrat, you, know, you sort of look, where's the Republican? Well, there were no votes last night, so none of them are in town. Um, so we got the most Republican-like Democrat we could get. Uh, and, uh, and so he's a little bit of each, you know, it's sort of on that, you know, that Kinsey curve, uh, maybe a six or four or something. And um, so there's that. I mean, I went so far as I just, just had somebody call Pat Toomey, who's a, who's a great guy, a senator from Pennsylvania, Republican. And I got him to try, so just call us on the phone. And he's at his uh, child's kindergarten graduation right now. Uh, and I said, just call us anyway. It'll be very human. Uh, uh, th that's not going to happen, but that will show you the perverse lengths I was willing to go uh, to have uh, representation. But without further ado, let me invite uh, Ed Luce uh, to, the, to the forum, chief U.S. commentator of the Financial Times. He is the author of the about-to-come-out book, The Retreat of Western Liberalism. Tomorrow he has a New York Times op-ed. Uh, for those of you who are subscribers, it gives you the teaser on it. Um, I'm reading the book right now. It's fantastic. So Ed is going to do an interview with Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia. Uh, good guy. So uh, Joe Manchin and Ed Luce, please join us. Thanks, Steve. All I heard was something about Senator Barroso and uh, his kid's kindergarten. Um, Where are we supposed to sit? Oh, it's quite I a long way away. Yeah, I think it might be better if you come over here. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It might work better.
Senator, it's, it's great to, to, to be with you. Um, uh, you are probably, maybe with the exception of Heidi Heitkamp, one of the most favorable Democrats to working with um, President Trump, with the Trump administration, establishing a bipartisan agenda, and um, enabling Trump to actually do things. How's that working out? Well, let me, let me start by saying, uh, a month before the election, before the general election, I was asked, and at that time, I don't think anyone in this room would have thought that Donald Trump would be president, or very few would have thought that. Mm -hmm. So I was asked, what, what are you gonna do if Donald Trump becomes president? And I said, I'm gonna do the same as I would as if Hillary Clinton becomes president, I'm gonna do my job. And my job is to be a US Senator, to go to represent my state of West Virginia, and represent the people of this great country and do everything I can to make my president successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that means give uh, input the best I can. If I'm opposed to something, I'll be an honest broker. I'm not gonna oppose it because I'm a D and you're an R or an R and a D, I, I, not how I do things. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna think that there's a better way and I have a better plan or I've made that mistake before, I hope you don't. Uh, and that's the way I approach it and that's what I have been doing and we've had a good open relationship. We've been able to speak about things and we agree to disagree and and uh, we'll see where it goes. So, I mean, if there was any other Republican president with exactly the same agenda, um, a tax reform, yeah. uh, scrapping Obamacare, infrastructure, um, presumably by now you'd have got some way down the road and your extended hand would have been met. But with Donald Trump, I mean, is there a conceivable scenario where you can get coherent legislation with your name on it as bipartisan bills with the Trump team? Can well, you, you see start that just, working? If you start with just with health care, yeah. Um, I told him, uh, and this was oh, right after maybe what, a couple weeks after he uh, came into office and we were, I was at the White House for something, we were talking on a piece of legislation, and I said, Mr. President, uh, in West Virginia, 100 and roughly 75 to 80,000 people receive health care for the first time. Mm -hmm. They have no idea how they got it. They, most of them voted for you because you won by 69%. They don't know how they got it. They don't know it was a Democrat initiative. They don't know it was an Obamacare or anything about that at all. But they will know who took it away from them. So I would be very careful uh, to go down the path you're going. And if you want to talk about repair, count me in. I know it needs to be repaired. The private market didn't work. We knew it wasn't going to work from day one. And I told him, I said, the Democrats made a big mistake in 2009. I wasn't there. They passed it with 60 Democrat votes, not one Republican. Did they make an effort? Could they have made a better effort? Could there have been some adjustments to where you have bipartisan? You don't have major policy such as that, health care, and not have some bipartisan buy-in. With that, that split our country unlike I've ever seen. I was head of the National Governors Association at that time, and I could tell, you could never tell, and if you were in an NGA meeting, National Governors Association meeting, you couldn't tell Democrat from Republican. We all had the same problems. Mm -hmm. We had road problems, infrastructure, we had education problems, we had Medicaid problems, and we all tried to help each other. But that one split us, and I saw what it did to the country. So I said, Mr. President, you're gonna go down the same path. I said, they're gonna pass it with only Demo Republicans, send it to the Senate, hope for budget reconciliation, get it done with 51 Republicans. You would think that someone would learn from somebody else's mistakes. You don't. So that's a good, exa that's a great yeah. example. You, there you are, a friendly Democrat, giving the president, President Trump, I'm, advice. I'm trying to be an honest broker. Is he taking this advice? Well, I, I can't say, <laughs> I can't say that. Uh, yeah. Is he listening? I think he listens, I really do. We, we, we've had good conversations, you know, what you see on television and the sound bites is not what I've seen when I'm face to face or we're on the telephone, you know. Uh, and uh, I always look for that pathway forward. I, 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 I've, I've been very open, honest. He asked, called me the other, uh, a couple weeks ago and asked me two things. Could you help me on health care and can you help me on um, taxes? Mm -hmm. I said, Mr. President, I really want to help you any way possible. I want you to be successful. On the health care, if you can get rid of the word repeal and talk, talk about repairing, mm -hmm. and I'll just use that schemat semantics there, you say repeal to West Virginia and 180,000 people think you're taking something away. You say repair, they think you're gonna fix it and make it better. Uh, we can work with that. We, can, we have a pathway forward. He thought so, about that and I think they have to go down. I think, they, they're, I think that my Republican friends are committed politically to voting for repeal. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe they have 50 votes in the Senate to do it as we speak. Mm -hmm. They might still take that vote. Then we move to really try to repair it. 
there are 10 or 12 of us, moderate, you know, uh, Democrats that really want to fix things. I think that the 100 members want to fix things. I'll, I'll preface that. But we'll sit down. You can put my name to it, and I'll look for different ways. I've said this. We gave 20 million people. Think about this. 20 million people got health care for the first time. Before they got health care, they used their health care delivery system was just emergency room. If you were a small business person or working for somebody and you didn't have the health care coverage, you used workers' comp. Mm -hmm. That was their delivery system. There was no preventive care. It was, in, you know, when there was a catastrophic illness or something, went to emergency room because they knew it couldn't be turned away. So I said, 20 million people got something they never had before, don't know what the cost is, and I can buy a box of Cracker Jacks, get the prize inside, and there will be some type of an instructions how to use that prize. Mm -hmm. We gave them the most valued thing you could ever have is health care, and not one word of instructions. Hey, quit going to the emergency room. Let's use it this way. There's tremendous savings. Nobody talks about any of this. It just blows my mind that we just want to throw things out. And if we all agree on pre-existing conditions, we agree on 26-year-olds, we agree on caps, we agree on the donut hole being filled, we agree on so many things, why do you want to throw it out in the most toxic atmosphere, think you can come back with 60 votes and fix something? makes no sense to me at all. So let me, um, let's get back to that in a minute. And so also, has he listened? I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> that was a, a polite a way of saying no, he doesn't listen. I, I, I were misreading that. Um, infrastructure tax reform and the fate of um, yeah. Obamacare appeal I'd like to get into um, in a moment. But let, let me just uh, get you onto your political situation. You face re-election next year mm -hmm. in a state where um, all 55 counties in the primaries voted for Bernie Sanders on the one side and Donald Trump on the other. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty tough state from which to behave as, or to try to present yourself as a bridge builder, isn't it? Politically, well, it's a very, very polarized. In 2012, Mitt Romney won my state by 35 points and I mm -hmm. won the election by 25 points. It was mm -hmm. a 60 point swing. Mm -hmm. I'm not an unknown commodity and good, bad or indifferent. People know who I am. I've been around probably some will say too long, but I've been around long enough since the 80s. I was in the state legislature. I ran for governor in 96, got defeated, thought I was out, did the best I could, came back for whatever reason in 2000, became secretary of state, governor in 2004, reelected in 2008, and then Bob Byrd died. And I thought, well, you know, we've been very successful in the state. Maybe we could take some of this common sense to Washington. And I figured out and told West Virginia, common sense is not real common in Washington. Mm -hmm. So. We've been uh, struggling ever since. But no, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about, everyone thinks, well, the Republican says, oh, yeah, that's our, that's our state, 43 points. Well, come on, let's have at it. Let's see. If you, if you see a future beyond coal, sure. is it possible to be elected in West Virginia? Oh, yeah. I mean, here's, coal's, coal plays a big, you know. Let me just say about what West Virginia has done for this country and people... We've done everything. We've done the heavy lifting. We've got more veterans per capita, shed more blood, lost more lives, cause of freedom. We've done the heavy job. We've done the heavy lifting. And coal was so important to the economy of this great nation and the superpower of the world because we had energy in our backyard that a coal miner got deferred from the military just because they had to provide the energy the country needed to, to keep going. In 46, they created a piece of legislation or the Krug Amendment that said that they will have lifetime guarantees on their health care mm -hmm. and their pensions mm -hmm. because Truman couldn't have them shut down because mm -hmm. the economy would have collapsed. With that being said, we've always tried to find a more balanced way of the economy and the environment. Think, people think, well, you come from West Virginia, Wyoming, or Kentucky, an industrial, you know, a energy producing state. Well, there's nobody who wants to drink dirty water or breathe dirty air. And we've developed the socks. Knox, which is scrubbers, low mm -hmm. NOx boilers, mm -hmm. bag houses for particulates. That's, it's not CO2 killing people in India or in China. It's particulates. We've been able to eliminate that. We can't even get our allied nations to use what we perfected. Seven billion tons of coal outside of the United States. There's about eight billion tons of coal being burnt annually. It's going to increase, not decrease, because it's the most plentiful, it's the most effective, efficient, high BTU fuel you have in the world. So let, let me challenge you on Next that. Next to nuclear. Last, last week, um, um, as we all know, President Trump withdrew uh, the United States from the Paris deal. You applauded him. Um, 
And we'll, one of the we'll reasons. We'll correct that a little bit. Okay. Well, you. I mean, you supported the the move. I never did. I never did think the Paris climate deal was a good deal. Um, I thought Obama did a bad deal of, of, of putting us in a position to where here's what China and India has used on us. And I know I've been over speaking to them. They're saying, yeah, but you built your country and think what you did. You were the great polluters and you built this and you got industrial might. You got the superpower of the world. You're going to deny us using the fuel we have in our backyard. I said, OK, we never had the technology back then. We developed the technology. You want to go ahead and build the coal fired plants based on 1940 and 50 technology. Shouldn't you at least use the scrubbers and low NOx boilers and high efficiencies that we've been able to develop and then get to the CO2 development? We need for carbon capture sequestration. But that requires subsidy, right? I mean, and, and Donald Trump actually scrapped the small $500 million green climate uh, fund. Just $500 million, he scrapped that. So his recommendation, is, his recommendation has been uh, His recommendation, he, but he hasn't done anything. I mean, that's a tiny drop in the bucket, but even that he's getting rid of, the subsidies to low-income countries to have cleaner technology. So how can you applaud that kind of move when it goes against exactly what you Well, I don't applaud that type arguing. of a move. I think it's wrong. It's short-sighted. Mm -hmm. I thought Senator, uh, I mean, I worked with Senator Obama when he was a senator from Illinois, coming from a coal state Indeed. in West Virginia. We worked mm -hmm. on different things, and he seemed to have a grasp of that. As soon as he became president, shut down completely, and we couldn't even speak mm -hmm. on the issue. And uh, West Virginia has more wind power than most any state east mm -hmm. of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. We're trying, we're an all-in energy po policy in West Virginia. We'll try everything that we possibly can, but you need base load. You've got to have you know, the reliability to the system today is so scary in my mind because of base load. Base load means you've got to have continuous 24 7 power mm -hmm. to keep the grid energized. There's only two things that do that. Without any interruptions, only two fuels do that coal and nuclear, mm -hmm. because they're on site. Gas now has become bigger than coal in producing power. We're using it as base load. But gas has to be delivered by pipelines, from terrorist attacks, from line breakage, to freezing up in the wintertime. A lot of things can interrupt that. You can have rolling blackouts and brownouts, so many different things. So we've got to continually look at how do we keep this country energized and competitive. So Cli that, the, the Paris thing gave China the ability to continue to, with all their old belching plants. We've gotten rid of ours. They still were able to keep them until till, till 2030. India is able to build all I, the new ones till 2050. Yeah, can I, can I just sort of check you on that point? India has agreed to limit its carbon emissions to double what it has now. India, after 2030. After 2030. India's per capita carbon emission is a tenth, below a tenth of the American per capita. So a limiting to doubling of now is limiting to a fifth of America's um, per capita carbon output. And you're saying that all that's it? coming from coal-fired plants in America? Well, no, actually, India is investing heavily in solar. I mean, and it's a country where one third of people don't have electricity. Oh, absolutely. That is a mega concession that but Trump every has one just of the, Every, every coal-fired plant they're building in India has no, they don't have scrubs. Right. They're not doing low NOx boilers. They're doing no bag houses, nothing. No, your point's taken. That we should be selling Poland doesn't. Cleaner, Poland's our, one technology. of our allies and doesn't do anything. But does walking away from Paris enable your scenario to I didn't come say true? walk away. I said renegotiate. Okay. It's a bad deal. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our trade deals are bad deals. Mm -hmm. I said renegotiate. You don't walk away. Mm -hmm. You just sit down and say, okay, we're going to correct the, the deck a little bit here. And if the president is good at negotiation, which he says he has been, and he's been successful in, in private life, then use the strength of what you know and what you can do to basically make better deals. Uh, so, um, I mean, this in a way could take up the whole conversation because it is so monumentally important, but there are other big items like tax reform. What, oh, prospects, yeah. <laughs> what prospects do you um, give to a grand bargain that Trump can actually get his act together and you can get involved in writing legislation that you can sell to West Virginians and to other moderate Democrats. What, on how do you rate the prospects on tax reform? Tax reform. I'm just amazed. I'm amazed that the entire, this entire city is not even talking about the $20 trillion growing debt we have mm -hmm. that we're passing on to generate. No one's looking at it. I mean, it's, it's, it's mute. I says, is anyone concerned? So for disclaimer, I'm a big uh, Simpson, uh, Bowl Simpson person. I truly believe it was a balanced approach. It was something that everybody uh, had something they didn't like, but it was something that did everything we stood to start repairing our financial. You got to get your financial house in order. 
Governors have balanced budget amendments, most governors do. Uh, so we had to look at our revenue and our expenses all the time. Every week a governor sits down with their uh, financial team and they tell you where you are so you make adjustments if you have to. Uh, we don't even take the GAO report here. General Accounting Office every year comes out with a wonderful report, tells us how much we've done and see how much we're wasting, how much we should be doing. We don't, nobody, nobody answers that. We have one piece of legislation, at least the president should answer, why are you not taking the recommendations of the GAO? and reducing size of government or overspending or overlapping or redundancy. You can't even get that. So do I think he can move forward? Sure. I, I talked to him about that and I said, Mr. President, I like your simplified approach from seven tax brackets to three. Uh, I said, I'm not sure the numbers work at 15. I can't understand a 15 percent corporate. I think 25 percent would be more realistic. Democrats would vote for 25. Mm -hmm. You might have a 15 percent repatriation to bring that money back, but then have a territorial to bring the inversions back. Do you, but do you know more about what he wants to get done than that one pager? I mean, when you talk to him. Uh, <laughs> take your time, Senator. Yeah. <laughs> this one could take time. <laughs> I, know, I don't know if anybody really knows. I think, you know, you got to look at Gary Cohn and Mnuchin on this. I think, you know, he has, he's put his team around him and they made a recommendation and advice. I, this pass-through, 15% pass-through, my goodness, we'll all be putting LLCs up and having pass-throughs. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be anything left. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's the way to go. I, I simply threw this out and see how this, I said, Mr. President, if you could look at 25% corporate, territorial, 25% corporate. The global, global corporate rate, global average corporate rate is about 22, 23. Mm -hmm. Why would we discount the greatest market in the world down to 15? Uh, it didn't make sense, okay? So I said 20, 25. Mm -hmm. Pass-through at 25. Mm -hmm. and put a 30% floor on the Buffett rule that basically 30% is the bottom. Okay, no matter how wealthy you are, you're going to pay at least 30% to live in the greatest, freest country with the greatest military, uh, the greatest intelligence community, and the ability to keep you safe and your money invested and secured. Why can't we have a tax program that does that? What did he say? He, he didn't jump on it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but he said, he said, we can talk. I said, you know, so I've said this, don't try to reinvent the wheel. The president has already have a plan, a simplified version of what Gary and, uh, and Steve Mnuchin put out. Use that template and find out what numbers work. That's the best way to approach it. Then everybody walks away with maybe a win-win. Good plan, new numbers, everything's working. Hey, we've done well. You hope. If you, uh, this week's Infrastructure Week, which is oh boy. a big yeah. deal for everybody, but including West Virginia. Well, we've all agreed that we should spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. Both sides agree one trillion is the magic number that should be invested in infrastructure. Well, from what I understand, this is 200 billion from the federal government at 20 billion a year for 10 years. Not quite a trillion dollars when, it, when you sort of break it down like that. What kind of infrastructure bill would you like to see? Well, we're, we're looking at an infrastructure bill that really rebuilds America. You have an infrastructure mm -hmm. bank. You have the states responsible for stepping up to the plate. Uh, and if we don't start doing that, and if we don't get our infrastructure in, in a globally competitive situation, and with uh, the deferred maintenance that we have going on now, you know, a lot of state governments and a lot of federal governments, they never build deferred maintenance in. They'll build something. You ever notice the colleges? They always have a building fund to build a new building. Mm -hmm. If they're state schools, when I was governor, they come to me and they said, we need a new air conditioner, we need a new heating system. I said, wait a minute, you just asked to build a new $45 million building. You have a building fund. Why don't you take care of what you had? I shut down every college in my state uh, on building funds until they took care of deferred maintenance. Made them know how serious we were about taking care of your, your own. But that's where we come. A bill that we're going to have, the Democrats, I can tell you, in the caucus, we're all behind a piece of legislation, we want to make sure it's paid for. We're not going to add another trillion dollars of debt and unpaid for. So stuff like, I don't know, a gas tax or a hike in the gas tax. You have I mean, to look at everything. You gas tax, you can look at gas tax from that stem. I've had, I've had thrown out and I've gone to West Virginia and talked to people in a state that's been economically challenged, as you know. Uh, and I said, what would you all think about half a percent of a national sales tax going directly? Mm -hmm. What do you think about an internet sales tax, which we don't collect the internet sales tax and it's killing the states. There's so much more that should be done that we're not even talking about because we're scared politically to talk about it. 
I said, if the people, average person, who's having a hard time understands they're going to have a better road, they don't want to place their tires or get alignments and fix things, they got bridges, they got internet connectivity, uh, they're willing to step to the plate. Does a gas tax do it? Uh, gas tax could help to a certain extent. It's not going to do what needs to be done. And people that don't even drive or have a car, everything they get is delivered by transportation, so they're using it anyway. So we've thrown that out and just seen how it comes back. I don't know, but I, mean, I know one thing, we have to pay for it. Um, now, again, this is a subject I'd like to drill down much further, but I'm noticing that time is um, slipping through our fingers, so <laughs> let me ask you about... Jim hey, hey, Ed. Yeah. I just call this one on the floor. Yeah, you got to, you know, it's Steve down here on the floor. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just want, you know, I'm like the Joel Gray of Cabaret in this. So I just want, I just want to say, you know, I want to ask one tiny question of Joe before you, before you, you ask your last question. You've had 136 days with Donald Trump, right? You had six years with Barack Obama. Who have you spent more time with? Oh, I spent more time with, in 30 days with Donald Trump than I did in six years with Donald Trump. Yeah, I knew we'd make news with that. Okay. Go ahead, Ed. Jim Comey. <laughs> Um, Good, bad, or indifferent, but they've all much more. Uh, Jim Comey is testifying. You're on the Senate right, Intelligence on Committee. Intel. What do you want to hear out of him? You know what? I've, had, uh, I, uh, I've always done this. I reached out to the citizens of my state of West Virginia, and they're very much in tune. I says, give me your questions. What questions do you want most asked? So our staff is breaking down. We've gotten over 500 requests right now. We'll probably have 1,000 by tomorrow. And we'll break it down, one, two, three, which ones are the first, second, third. The most interesting one that I had, I was at a couple of town hall meetings, and people stood up. Now, these are probably Trump supporters. I'm sure they voted for President Trump. And they asked the question, he says, Senator, if Jim Comey felt that he was in an uncomfortable situation at a, at a, at a dinner with the president, and he felt the dinner, uh, the, the questions or the conversation broached, uh, maybe to where there was a, not only a conflict, but uh, obstruction of justice, why didn't he act upon it? He's such a tremendous law enforcement agent, uh, head of the FBI. Um, why would he go home and just make notes? Why wouldn't he act upon it? And then why did he foul it away? It's your supposition behind that. This is a that. person, the question asked, and I didn't have an answer because I don't have that answer. I hope to get that answer. Your, your supposition behind that is that the problem is more with Comey or, and his? I think Comey is a, is a, is a very honorable, for everybody mm -hmm. that I've ever spoken to, that know Jim Comey on a personal and a professional basis, think he's just an outstanding person. We have Steve breathing down our neck, so thank <laughs> you so much, Senator. What a great interview. Thank you, Ed Luce. Thank you, Senator Manchin. And Senator, you get to ask all those questions. You get to be the interview on Thursday with James Comey, so we'll all be watching, we'll but thank you very much. Edward Luce, great interview. Thank you, and we'll look at your New York Times piece tomorrow, and of course your book, uh, which will soon be out, The Retreat of Western Liberalism.